<laughs> well, all right, there you go. Well, I thought that, but then I'm seeing, I'm seeing them up here playing, and I'm going, am I, am I, am I missing something here? I mean, you know, we, I, didn't, I didn't work on anything. <laughs> I didn't work on anything. Uh, so I'm just, <laughs> me and Joe, we were out of the loop, weren't we? I'm telling you. <laughs> if you wonder what happened, let me see if you wondered if I have anything to do with the music, you, there's your answer right there. I just come enjoy it, and that's all that I do. And uh, so anyway, bless the Lord. All right, good, good, good. We've been in Luke 21 as a jumping off start, starting point every week in this series of the best day ever. Or obviously, the best day that you'll ever have is the day that Jesus comes back to get you. And that's going to be a great day for all of us, and it's going to change everything about uh, our existence and what a wonderful change it's going to be. And Jesus said in Luke 21, by beginning at verse 25, just one of the many places Jesus talked about this, by the way, uh, and there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, confusion, and, and no answer to it, and that's exactly... We could check, check, check that. And the seas and the waves roaring, disturbed, restless nations of people. Men's hearts failing them from Phobos, fear, terror, terrorism on the earth. And the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Those are the things we put our trust in. Uh, religion, um, government, finances, social standing, uh, patriotism, uh, you know, money, what, whatever, whatever is the power of our heaven is, is going to be shaken. And I don't know about you, but that is definitely happening today. Uh, everything that we used to have nailed down seems to be coming up, you know, and, and all of the great values and, and history and, and everything about our life that many of us that at least are older like myself, we grew up with and we honored and, and they were big standards in our life. Man, they are just being rattled now. I mean, we still have them, and that's why we get so angry about all this stuff that's going on, because all that stuff matters to us. But Jesus said, hey, make no mistake, the heavens are going to be shaken. Yeah, what you trust in, what you depend, that's, I mean, all that's going to be right. See, these are, this is just a, an accumulation of all these different things that are happening, and this is only a small list. And he said, all right. Verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in cloud with power and great glory, the rapture. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. So Jesus said, when you see these terrible things begin to happen, don't let them seduce you into taking your eyes down and watching them. Because if you do, you're going to get distracted and you're going to get discouraged and depressed and all of that. When you see these things begin to happen, it's not going to take long, Jesus said. It's not, this is not going to be a hundred-year deal. This is not going to be decades worth of deal. This is going to be a relatively short time. When they begin to happen, man, it's going to happen quickly, the follow-up. And then Jesus said that he's going to come and, and, uh, and, our, and he's going to bring our redemption with us, with him. And to redeem means, just as a reminder, to redeem means to buy back or to purchase back. So God made us. We belong to God. He blew the breath of life into us. He created us. We belong to him. We were his possession as long, and the earth was his possession. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they turned over the, and we call it the title deed, just for lack of a better term for it, the authority that God had given them they turned over, they gave to Satan by their sin. And Jesus came to this earth and was born on this earth and lived on this earth and fought battles as a physical man on this earth and as the son of God on this earth. As man, he was tempted in every way like as we are yet without sin. As man, he got tired, he got thirsty, he got hungry. He had all kinds of physical issues going on just like we human beings had. And he was taken into the wilderness and he was tempted and Satan said at one point, look at all the kingdoms of the world out there. If you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you the, the authority for these kingdoms. Satan said, for, because it belongs to me, because it was given to me. That's what he said. 
And he's right. It was given to him. And he said, I have the right to give it to whoever I want to. So if, if you'll just take the shortcut, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. Just here, bow down to me, and I'll give you the authority back. And Jesus said, no, devil. Uh, I, I, I'm, I think I'll just go ahead and die for it. And he died for it, and he took the, took the title deed back to the earth and to the authority of the earth. And when he comes back, he's bringing that back with him, and he's going to give us all of those things that we lost when Adam and Eve, as our progenitors, as the, as the, as the beginning of mankind, that they lost, he's bringing back, he has redeemed it. And this tells us what heaven is going to be like. You know, one of the things I think, one of the reasons why people don't get more excited about heaven, and, and I'm not saying that, that there's anybody that says, I don't want to go to heaven. But if you got really digging deep with them, it, it would be like, well, I want to go to heaven when I die, but they're not all that fired up about what it's actually going to be because they have a lot of misconceptions. They don't really know what heaven's going to be like. So they, they're not as fired up about it as they should be. And that's part of what this series is about. Really, if you ask me, Pastor, why, why did you uh, even begin to think about these kind of things and why would you share these things with us? Well, the big part of the reason is because I, I wanted you to see what heaven's really going to be like. Out of the word now, I mean, I know we have all kind of books that have been written in movies and all of that kind of stuff, and that's just fantasy land. It's just imagination. What the Bible says is what's real. That's the truth, what's real. And so, and God told us all about heaven. He told us all kinds of information about heaven. And it's a place that we really can get pumped up about. And so, anyway, that's kind of what this is about. And when Jesus comes back for us, he brings our redemption. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your head, uh, keep, look up, look up, for your redemption draws near. What are we looking for? We're looking for our redemption that Jesus is bringing back. So that's a great and exciting thing. And there were five things that Adam and Eve lost, and we've looked at four of them. They lost a perfect body. Their bodies were perfect. Created perfect, if they were here today and they hadn't sinned, their body would be no different than it was the day they were created. They would still be the same age. They would still be the same shape. They would still, everything, but, but they sinned, and when they sinned, their bodies began to decay, and they died. Jesus is going to bring us our bodies back when he comes. And they lost uh, perfect pleasure. They were created in the Garden of Eden, which means delight. God gave them uh, pleasure in all of the garden. They, had, they, could, they, they enjoyed everything. There was no work. There was no pain. There was no loss. There was none of that kind of stuff. And everything they did was pleasurable and enjoyable, and they walked with God every, every day. But when they sinned, they lost that perfect pleasure also. God's bring, Jesus is bringing that back. We get our pleasure back. Third, they lost their authority, which I've already kind of mentioned in the fact that we have authority now, but it's limited it's a down payment on authority because we, at one time, Adam and Eve had all authority, physical, spiritual, everything. The whole earth was theirs and there was nothing that was not under their authority. Well, when they sinned, all of a sudden, that authority was lost. When Jesus came and, and, and saved us, we got a deposit placed in us called the Holy Spirit that gives us a spiritual authority, not total authority, but a spiritual authority, it is a down payment. It's earnest money, and, and hopefully I'll talk about that if I don't preach too long about everything else. It's earnest money, and you guys that have ever bought a house or done some big transaction, you know what earnest money is. The Holy Spirit is, is earnest money on redemption that Jesus is bringing back. I'll show you that in a word. Uh, no, the fourth thing they lost was their home. They got kicked out of the house perfect place. Uh, great God lived with them in the Garden of Eden when they sinned. Uh, God uh, put them out because the tree of life was in there. And remember, if they had eaten of the tree of life, they would have lived forever in that lost, fallen condition. And so God had to protect them from themselves. And he put them out of the garden and put cherubim angels. You know, uh, this, this is something, I, just a little call to your attention. You know, there are all kind of misconceptions about angels that people have. 
Uh, just There are probably more misconceptions about angels than there are about heaven. Uh, people have all kind of crazy ideas about angels. But one of the big crazy ideas they have is that there are, there's such a thing as a baby angel. Um, if, if you've heard people talk, old people, older people like me, used to call babies, uh, as a term of endearment, a, a little cherub, which was for, stood for a cherubim, a, an angel, a little cherub, as if somehow there were baby angels and the baby angels were called cherubs. I just want you to notice who God put in charge of protecting the Garden of Eden when he put Adam and Eve out. They were cherubim angels, and they had flaming swords that went around in every direction. Uh, doesn't sound like a baby to me. Uh, it sounds like a warrior, actually. You wouldn't want to encounter that. And then today, uh, they lost their intimacy with God. The most important benefit that Adam and Eve lost when they sinned was their intimacy with God their direct relationship and their intimacy with God. Here's how it happened. Genesis chapter three, um, it reads like this, beginning at verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree uh, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So she also gave uh, to her husband and, uh, with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God said to Adam and uh, called Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now the next line I didn't put in, but just so you know, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? That tree of knowledge? Yeah. See, Adam and Eve, up until this point, had face-to-face -face intimacy with God every day. Obviously, they weren't aware how precious that was. And, and I can give them a little bit of a break because they had nothing to compare it to. They had no, they had nothing, they, they didn't know what it was like to be without God because they were made by God. And when God made them, then every day, all the time, God just came down and God walked with them and God talked with them and God interacted with them. And they saw God face to face every day. So they, 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 they obviously began to treat their relationship, their intimacy with God in a, in a casual way, let's just say. And, and that's natural. I'm not criticizing that. We all do that. We get familiar with things. We get comfortable with things. And we don't protect things that are valuable like we should. And they just didn't have any way to know how valuable this was because they had never not had it in their life. And then t Satan took advantage of that and he came in and he uh, basically seduced them into uh, to, to giving them. He took, he took an advantage over them. So let me give you three observations concerning redeemed intimacy with God. Let me tell you about the three things that redeemed intimacy does. Number one, redeemed intimacy alters the point of view of my relationship with God. Adam and Eve had a open face-to-face -face relationship with God, a perfectly intimate relationship with God. That's what face-to-face -face means. When Adam and Eve fell, they lost that face-to-face -face relationship with God. And now because of that, we do not have a face-to-face -face intimacy with God. Let me read you. This is, the great, this is the great verse that tells us this. It's in 1 Corinthians 13. And you know, 1 Corinthians 13 starts out with, uh, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I'm sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Then it goes on to give us all those descriptions of love. Well, I'm gonna start in verse eight, kind of right in the descriptions because I'm not talking about love. I want you to see something else here. This is what our point of view is now and how it changed. All right, beginning at verse eight, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. 
for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So how do we know things now? We, we just know part of it. We don't know everything. We have limited knowledge, right? We have limited time. When I was a sp child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Two important elements are stated here. A is we will no longer have a frustrating, invisible relationship with Jesus. When he comes, we will no longer only see Jesus by faith. We will have a visible relationship with him immediately when he comes. We will have that face-to-face -face re relationship with Jesus. You know, when you have an intimate relationship with someone and you can see them, their face, you, you get to see uh, what their face looks like. You get to see how it reflects uh, thoughts and feelings. You, you can tell when somebody, looking at their face, you can tell when they're pleased. And you can tell when they're not pleased. And you can tell what mood they're in. And you can tell what they think. Did you know that 65% of all communication is nonverbal? Expressions, body language. So when, 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 I, when I can see Jesus face to face, I'm gonna know what Jesus thinks about things, how he feels about things. Right now, the devil takes advantage of the fact that we can't see Jesus face. The devil says to, think, uh, says to us like, uh, look, uh, he doesn't love you. Now, the scriptures say he loves us. Uh, great men and women of God say he cares about us. We believe by faith that, that he died for us and he'll do anything for us and he'll protect us and he loves us. But, 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 but that's by faith and the devil comes to us and says, no, he doesn't love you. He doesn't want you. You've sinned too much. You're too wicked to be one of his children and he manipulates us because we can't see Jesus' face. Because I honestly and genuinely believe that if we could see Jesus' face, there wouldn't be any question in our minds about whether Jesus loved us. When we get to see Jesus' face, we'll be able to tell what Jesus thinks about things, how he feels about things, how much he loves us. Because Jesus' face is going to reflect that intimate relationship that God intends for us to have. So, verse 12 says, now we see through a glass darkly. We, we may have dreams about the Lord. We may have had visions about the Lord. The Lord might have revealed things to us in prayer, we might, we might conceptualize God when we're worshiping or praising him. We might have sensed God at some extremely tough moments of our life. But we have never seen God face to face. We have only seen God through darkened glass. Our, our vision is obscured. It, it, it's, it's not total. And we only see things in a, in, a, in, a, in a fuzzy way. But then you're going to see him face to face for all eternity. So when Jesus comes after us, we're, our point of view of our relationship with Christ is going to change. Here's the second thing that verse says. We will no longer have only partial knowledge of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Verse 12 finishes by saying, we know in part, now we know in part, but then I will know just as also I am known. Jesus 
knows us intimately. He knows our thoughts. He knows our feelings. He knows what we need before we even pray and ask for it, the Bible says. He knows everything about us. So just as intimately as Jesus knows us, when he comes back, we're going to know him just that intimately. And we're going to know the things of his kingdom just as intimately as that. Right now, we have a, we have a, a, a down payment on our intimate relationship with Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, know you, I know you know Jesus. I know you love Jesus. I love Jesus. I've known Jesus. I've known the Lord for 50 years. And, and, and I, I, you know, I've, I have lots of relationship with, with Jesus. But I'm just telling you, no matter how much we experience him at the moment, our knowledge of him, along with our understanding about his kingdom, is just tiny compared to what we're going to know when we, Jesus comes to this. Here's what Paul, here, this is how Paul relates that concept to us. Listen to it. All right, this is in Ephesians chapter 1, and listen to what Paul says about it. Verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise and the glory of God. Now, I know that's kind of verses that has a few commas in it. And so it has several little movements. But just briefly what that is saying is that God breathed into Adam at, at the breath of life. And what God breathed into Adam was not oxygen. What God breathed into Adam was his spirit. The spirit of life is what the Bible calls it. God breathed into Adam the spirit of life. We know it wasn't just oxygen because after they sinned, they still had oxygen in their lungs. They had just lost the spirit of God. That's what Romans 3.23 says when it says, for all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin in its essence is a loss of the glory of God. So what Adam and Eve lost in the garden was not oxygen that kept them alive. What they lost in the, in, in the garden of Eden was the spirit of God. The spirit of God was taken from them and they began to die. Now what Paul says here is, Paul says the day that you received Jesus Christ, the day that the spirit of God was placed back in you because you said yes to Jesus, the, that Holy Spirit on the inside of you became promise or earnest until the full redemption that Jesus is going to bring back is placed in us. The, the, the clearest example of earnest with us and, and that we can understand is earnest money. And I know you guys know this, especially all of us older, because we've bought homes and different things that we had to put some money down. But just to, to, to bring the concept all together for us, here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, look, when, when you came to Christ, you came to Jesus, you were making a, a, an investment of yourself in, in, in a belief that one day uh, something great was going to happen to you. And what God did is God said, I'm going to give you some earnest money. And you know what that means. You're selling your home. Uh, people come and look at your home, and they say, man, I want this. And you say, well, how bad do you want it? Man, I want it bad. I don't want somebody else to buy it. Well, I see about three people coming down the driveway right now, and they might want it. And so the person says, well, here, here, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, let me give you some money. Let me give you a little bit of money. And that's earnest money. And you know what that says? I'm serious. I'm serious about buying. I really want this place. And, and, and God is really serious about us. And so he said, look, when, when you give yourself to me, I'm going to give you some earnest money. And that earnest money is the Holy Spirit, and he's going to stay deposited in you until the day that you inherit the real redemption that Jesus Christ is going to bring back with you. 
God is just that serious about our life, and he wants us to know, look, this is not just something I'm popping off about. Here's your guarantee. Here's the spirit of promise. That's what he's called. Oh, my goodness. You know, what, you know the biggest question I get asked about, about what heaven, how, how we're going to be in heaven? The biggest question that, that I get asked is, will we know each other in heaven? Well, uh, let me just skip over something like that. I'm, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Do you know each other now? You know, I don't know what we think heaven's going to be like as far as knowledge, but this verse says we're going to know everything. Just like we're known and what's known about us, everything's known about us, right? Jesus knows everything about us. God knows everything about us. And so when he comes back, I'm going to know just like he knows me right now. So I can't imagine being, being smarter in my, in my earth body than I will be in my resurrected body. And I know everybody. I know my family. I know all of that. People must think that when we go to heaven, we're ghosts with a lobotomy or something. You know, <laughs> we just kind of fly around heaven uh, in this peaceful state of mind, looking confused and, and, and all that kind of stuff, as if somehow your mother could be there and pass by and you wouldn't even notice that it's mom. Like, hey, my, you know, you, you, it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't know. You might know God, and you might, when you see God, you might know him. But other than that, you know, you're just pretty much, uh, everything's pretty much a mystery to you. Now, see, nothing could be further to the, from the truth than that. In heaven, you're going to know everybody. By the way, let me just ask you, do you really think you know everybody now? And I'm not talking about everybody in the world. I'm just talking about the people that you know. Do you really know the people that you know now? Well, when you, when you see them, you ask them a question, right? How you doing? What's their answer? Fine. Are they really Fine. May be or may not. We don't tell each other the truth about things like that, do we? We just tell, what we, tell each other what we think uh, we want them to know. Because we have to be a little guarded. We have to protect ourselves from some things. You know, I've, I don't know about you, but I've been betrayed by some people. And I don't know who I can trust a lot of times. And I've trusted people with information about me that they used against me or that, you know, they betrayed that information. So over the years, I've even become more calloused about that, about really exposing anything other than what I want you to see. And I'm not surprised because you only give me what you want me to see. As far as I know, everybody in this church is wonderful, great, mature, Christian, sweet, gentle, love the Lord, you know, dance in the spirit, you pray every night. I, I, it, it, because that's all I know about you. Because that's all you've shown me about you. That's all I see about you. So we don't really know each other like for real, do we? Even now. But when we get to heaven, we're going to know, we're going to know everything. We're going to be able to trust everybody. We're going to know as we have been known, and finally we'll be able to really know each other um, in, in perfect peace. Uh, we won't be fearful, perfect love, and perfect harmony. You'll know all your relatives, uh, the ones that will be there, you know, of course. And speaking of relatives, there won't be, the devil won't be there. And no, and, and no sin will be there. No sin nature, no ego, no pride, no competition, no jealousy, no envy, no dysfunction, no past hurts, no bad memories. So we will always be able to fully love without fear. And the most important thing we will know is that, is that we will know Jesus and have perfect and total intimacy with him. So my point of view has changed. And I get to see him face to face. All right, second thing, second observation about intimacy with God. Number two, redeemed intimacy with God completes the knowledge he intended me to receive through a mature relationship with him. God intended for Adam and Eve to grow up in the garden with him as a mentor, as a father. God loves to father. Fathers love to place into the life of their children values, understanding, skills. I mean, Justin, my son's sitting on the, on the front row. When he was growing up, I, I took him everywhere with me. 
We did everything together. Of course, I only had you know, one son and one daughter, and so it, it wasn't as difficult as some of you that have had five children or six or whatever it might be, and you'd have to bring a tribe with you everywhere. I had the freedom of one, one son. And so I just took him, and, and what I was doing is I was training him all along. I would say, you know, here's how you do this, and he would get in there and do it, and I would introduce him to people, and I'd say, I want you to meet Mr. So-and-so. So, you know, one of these days, that's, he might be important to you, and just all kinds of things like that. That's fathering. God loves to father his children, and God's intention in the Garden of Eden was that he would father Adam and Eve for eons, and teach them and give them knowledge about the things that they would know. The reason I'm telling you this is because God, I, I, because I'm about to tell you that when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them intelligence, but he did not give them knowledge. They could learn things, but they didn't know everything right off of the bat. And God, because God wanted to father them, as far as I know, the only instructions God had given them before Satan intervened and took advantage of them was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the, the, the fish and the animals and the, all of the creation. And he had also told Adam before Eve was even created, hey, uh, that, don't bother that tree down there. So they, I, I'm just saying, what they, they had a very thin Bible, didn't they? They didn't have very many verses in their Bible. And that was the instruction. That, that was the, the extent of the, of the knowledge that they really had because God wanted to teach them and mentor them as he goes. So why in the world would God create Adam and Eve with intelligence and not give them knowledge because God wanted to give them something better than knowledge. They, he wanted to give them himself. Can you imagine having the omniscient creator of the universe? Omniscient means all-knowing. He knows everything. Can you imagine having the, uh, the omniscient creator of the universe walking around with you and talking around and talking to you and being your mentor every in every section of life that's what god intended god divinely disabled them is what i'm basically saying in order for them to cling to him and and want to learn from him and look god does the same thing to us we're all divinely disabled we can't do everything. We don't know everything. We pray about things. We ask God, God, I gotta have your help in this. God, can you show me what to do? Teach me. I don't understand what's going on. I mean, we go to God all the time. Why? Because he's divinely disabled us so that we'll seek him as a father. Well, God divinely disabled Adam and Eve so that, he could, so that they would cling to him. And so God wanted to lead them and teach them. And when they had a need, they could come to God and they could say, God, uh, what about this? And then he could just teach them what it is they would have to know. And he would know everything. I know, you know, nowadays we think we have these little boxes. I, you know, what is it? Um, uh, Siri and, uh, and Alexis and uh, Amazon somebody and then uh, that uh, box, the Echo and all that. I, in other words, you, you can talk to those things and they'll tell you information. Or your little phone, you know, when you talk to it. Now, uh, just imagine if you had God. Now, because those little boxes can tell you a lot of stuff, but they, it, there's a lot of things it can't tell you. It can't tell you anything um, uh, about spiritual. It can't tell you anything about your nature or anything about anything that is not perfectly objective in life. But God can tell us everything when we go to him, and that's what God wanted to, to do. God wanted to teach them about life and how to live it. Because God could have zapped them if he wanted to. God could zap us with all knowledge at any moment. God could zap us about anything, and he could have zapped Adam and Eve, but God's not a zapper. God is a father, and God didn't want to zap them instantly and make them have all knowledge about things. He wanted to lead them over time to know 
because God created them dependent on him. Because intimacy always depends on dependency. The more intimate you are, the more dependent. You can't have spiritual intimacy without, without, without spiritual dependency. So God created them that way. And, and the problem with us is, as human beings is, we have a problem with dependency on God. The Bible tells us that we do. As a matter of fact, the greatest or the, the, the biggest analogy that we have in the Bible as a description of our relationship with God is he's called the shepherd and we're called the sheep. Psalm 23, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. Here's David, a shepherd, who understands everything about shepherd and sheep, saying, you know what we're like? We're like sheep. Sheep are completely dependent upon the shepherd because sheep are pathetically weak in many areas. Let me, this is what Jesus said about it. Same thing, John 10. I'm a, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So when God looks at us, God sees sheep. Now, sheep are cute, you're, so you're cute, you know. Sheep are, are lovable, so you're just as lovable and, 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 and cute as can be to God. But sheep are also pathetically weak. They can't navigate. They'll get, they get lost. I mean, without a shepherd, they don't even know where the water is or the grass is. They, they, have to, they, they can't navigate anything. You've never heard of a homing sheep, right? And, and they can't carry a load, any burdens. You never heard anybody say, you know, I think I'm about to try to uh, hike up Camp, uh, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, and I'm going to have lots of supplies. You know what I need to do? I need to go get me a good pack sheep. That's what I need. And they can't defend themselves. You've never heard of a, an attack sheep, Right? When was the last time you were walking down a lonely street in a dark alley and you just happened to notice around you there was a sheep following you and you got frightened about it? Like some kind of thug sheep, you know? No. Sheep. Who's afraid of a sheep? Nobody. Sheep are completely dependent upon the shepherd and one of the most pathetic things in the world is the picture of a sheep out on his own. Here's what Isaiah said about us. This is us. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the garden, there was a dynamic that was going on that we need to understand because it's the same dynamic that's happening in our lives right now. And, and, and it is this, that God the Father created these wonderful beings. They were perfect in their creation, but they were not complete. And they were not complete because God wanted them to depend on him so he didn't give them complete knowledge. He gave them himself and said, I'll teach you whatever you need to know. I'll answer any question that you have because I want to be your father. There are two sides to the cross, right? There's our side of the cross. And on our side of the cross, we say, Jesus, 
thank you for coming to this earth and giving yourself so that I could be saved and come into your presence again. The other side of the cross is God's side of the cross where God looks at us and God says, it was worth everything I had to pay to be able to come into your presence again. That's what the cross was about. The cross was about a heart sick father who sent his only begotten son so he could come back into your presence again and you could come back into his presence again. Because God, simply God just loves his family. And he wants to be with his family. And we are his children. And he loves us. And the cross was about giving him the opportunity to come back into our lives. That's how much God loves us. We didn't go to him. He came to us. He took the initiative. He's the one that says, I want my family so bad. Uh, Jesus, let's go down there and die and, and shed your blood and be abused and be mistreated and, 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 and get that title deed of the earth back because I want to go down there and be with my, with my family. That's what the cross was all about. But the devil came into the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve were very naive and they had God, but they, didn't, they were inexperienced and the devil did what he always does. He offered them an exchange. Something for someone. The devil said, look, I'll give you a piece of fruit. And the, interestingly... God, God could have zapped them with complete knowledge of everything right there on the spot in a moment's twinkling of an eye. But he didn't do it, and I've been preaching about that. The temptation of the devil was, if you will go down there and get a piece of that fruit off of that tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will immediately know everything. You'll be just like God. That's what he told him. And so the temptation was actually to zap themselves. God didn't do it, but the devil said, you know, you can do it. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to depend on him. The day that you eat this fruit is going to be the day that you know everything. So look, don't worry about him. Just go down there and, and take care of yourself. And so what Adam and Eve did is Adam and Eve traded God, someone, for a piece of fruit, something. And, and because they did, they fell and they died. Why? Because the devil is a liar. Because he always over-promises and under-provides. Because he's a, 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 a liar and, and a murderer. And the same scheme that Satan had for Adam and Eve, he has for all of us. He wants to lure us away from God and our, dependence in, and our dependence on God and our intimacy with God in this relationship. And he wants to give us something for someone. Look at 1 John 2 says this. Look, look at it. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. What is, what is John telling us here? John is telling us, look, we don't, we're not to love the world. And what, what does he mean by the world? The, the planet, earth? I mean, is it wrong for us to love the earth, the planet? No, he's not talking about the planet. God created the planet. The planet is a creation of God. It's all right for us to love this wonderful creation of God. 
God created this wonderful planet for all of us to enjoy, and so it's not worldly to love the physical earth and the planet that we live on. When John says, don't love the world, the world is a system. The Bible says that it is a system that is led by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And the system has been created by, the world system has been created by Satan in order to replace your relationship with God the Father. Because everything God offers to us, the devil offers a counterfeit of that to us. Something for someone. Several examples. Just quickly, this first one is a little bit longer so y'all don't panic. Uh, they're not all long like this, but money versus provision. God says he'll give us provision. The devil says, don't worry about provision. I got you some money. So God offers himself as a provision for, you know what the word provision means? It means for the vision. So God says, all right, I've given you a vision. I've given you a heart. I've given you a purpose. You're seeking me. You're doing, all right, I'm going to give you everything you need for the vision. And the devil comes along and says, wait a minute. You don't need that guy over there. I got, I got some money for you. Let me, let me give you a little bit of money. So God is our Father, and Jesus told us in the Lord's Prayer, you remember what he said, or in the model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, that we go to God every day and we say, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, God, uh, we need your provision today so that we can make it do what, whatever, whatever it, it is. Because God doesn't just give us uh, money. God gives us other things, right? God, yeah, God gives us directions. God gives us peace. God gives us vision. God gives us resources. God, I mean, God's provision provides for the vision. But the devil offers us mammon. You remember what the Bible says about mammon, right? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and, and mammon. Or you'll love one and hate the other, or hate one and love the other. Mammon is the money God. And so, so the devil offers mammon for everything that God offers provision for. The God says, I'll make you secure. Mammon says, so will I. If you, God says, uh, I'll make you free. And the devil says, I'll give you money. Mammon says, I'll make you free. God says, he'll give you an identity. Mammon says, just show this money around and, and you'll gain an identity really quick. So Mammon comes and says to us, you don't need to serve God. You don't need to be moral. You don't need to, have a, uh, to pledge allegiance to a higher moral being. All you need is money. And this is the mantra of the world. So Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, because the devil always has a counterfeit for God. This is what Paul told Timothy, but know this, verse one, chapter three, verse one. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, <laughs> disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unforgiving, slanderers without natural control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, I mean, headstrong, <laughs> so King James word, heady, uh, haughty, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying its power, and from such turn away. So people in the last day are going to be lovers of money and they're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny God's power. In other words, they're going to love, they say they love God, but they don't trust God to give them provision. They trust money to give them a provision. So you can be on your way to heaven and God loves you, but the devil tries to do the same thing to us that he did to Adam and Eve. He tries to give us something for someone. The area of love and lust. And let me just say enough about that to say, the world offers lust, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. God gives us love. God says, I'll give you a deep, everlasting love. Don't let the devil counterfeit something for someone. Pride versus promotion. God said, I'll promote you. God says, I'll take care of you. I'll move you forward in life. The devil says... Talk about yourself. Uh, build yourself up. You got to get yourself out there and put yourself forward. 
and, and he promotes for us to be proud of ourselves and so forth. What does, and the Bible says, uh, according to the book of James, James 4.10, that uh, if we'll humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that the Lord will lift us up. If, we're pride, if we use pride, it's gonna destroy our life and it's gonna put us down. So anyway, that's, that's something for someone. So God did not give Adam and Eve knowledge, but when Jesus comes back, he's gonna bring all knowledge with it and we're gonna know everything. Let me give you this third one real quick. Redeemed intimacy with God reveals his foresight of free will for my choice to love him. When Jesus comes back, and he brings our redeemed intimacy, we're gonna have a, a tremendous appreciation for the fact that God had enough foresight to offer his creation free will. So let me talk about free will for a second. Why did God set Adam and Eve up for temptation by telling them in the Garden of Eden that they couldn't eat of that tree down there of the knowledge of good and evil. Why was it that God created a garden with something in it that they couldn't eat? Was God setting them up to fail? Well, let me, let me just, let me, let me answer that question with a series of questions. And if you have the, the handout, the questions are on the back. But I think any reasonable person should ask this question. All right, now listen to this. I'm telling you that the reason God set the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden and said, don't eat of that, there's a purpose for that. It wasn't to God, that God just wanted to restrict them. There was a purpose for that. And here are some questions. And each question is gonna start with what kind of God, all right? Because I want to show you that God has some choices. That God, there, there were many choices that God had in how he's going to relate to his creation. And God could have made any of these choices. And, and, and he had, the, I mean, he's God. He created. He, he had every, every option that was available. So why did he do what he did? Number one, what kind of God would live alone and not create any other beings to relate with? Well, he just wanted to live alone. He, he didn't want any relationships with anything and anybody. All right, that we would say, okay, a strange God would do that. All right, let me, let's move on. What kind of God would create creatures to relate with but have a very distant and uncaring relationship with them? By the way, there's a belief system called deism. And some of our founding father were, fathers were deist. And a deist is simply somebody who believes there is a God and that God created everything, but they also believe that God is not personal, that God does not personally get involved in your life, so he's not watching you, he's, he's at a distance, uh, what Bette Midler, Bette Midler saying. God is watching you from a distance, that's deism. But that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus said God was like, right? Because Jesus said, God knows the number of hairs on our head, right? And mine, you know, he doesn't have a lot of them to count anymore. He's kind of taking it easy on himself. Jesus said that God knows what you need before you even ask him. God knows what's going on in your heart and the secrets of your heart and rewards you openly for it. Jesus knows everything. Jesus is the exact opposite of a God who goes away after creation and just sets things spinning and says, all right, do the best you can, you know. Here's the third question. What kind of God would create man to relate with but fail to give him a free will? In other words, we're, we would be programmed just like a microwave or a vacuum cleaner and we would, we, we would do exactly what God programmed us to do and nothing else. We don't have free will. We're just programmed by a creator and we do what we're programmed to do. Well, that would be like an authoritarian ogre, you know, that creates something and doesn't give it any opportunity to be free. Number four, what kind of God would create man with a free will but with no way to express our will against him? Did you know in order to have free will, 
It's not free if you can't express it against the one who gave it to you. Let me, let me read you something. I wrote this and I'm gonna read it for the sake of time. Let's say that I'm the creator. I'm gonna create beings that are going to live in Keith land. I'm Keith, the Lord of Keith land. And I create these beings and they say, oh Lord Keith, thank you for creating us. And I say, my pleasure. Welcome to Keith land. I want you to know that I love you and you can have anything you want. Yes, you, you have a free will and you can have anything in Keithland. They cheer and say, that's fantastic. So two or three years later, uh, two or three years go by and my subjects come to me one day and ask, Lord Keith, is there anything in this land that you don't want us to have? Well, my beloved creation, I love you, and you can have anything in Keith land. Everything here is for your enjoyment. Then they would respond, well, Lord Keith, if there's nothing that we can choose that you don't want us to have, then we really don't have free will. You have simply limited our choices to only that which you desire. Free will is not free will unless you can use it against the one who gave it to you. Free speech, by the way, the First Amendment of our Constitution, free speech is not free speech if you can't say unpopular things. Nobody has to protect speech that says popular things. Everybody wants you to say that. But when you say unpopular things, if you have free speech, you have the right to say that and no one is going to attack you and destroy your life and your job and try to kill you and put you out of business and destroy your family for what you say. The, the attack culture of cancel culture is anti-free speech. Same thing with free will. You have to be able to express it in unpopular ways or it's not free. If there was no tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, how could God say we have the freedom to choose? It would be a sham and he would be a charlatan. If God created Adam and Eve in a world where everything was God's will, they could not use anything against him. They couldn't violate him in any way. There must be a tree of knowledge of good and evil there so we would have the choice that we can make against God or we really don't have a free will. There must be a choice or God will never know our true love for him. In other words, if we didn't have a choice, God wouldn't know if we chose him, if we would choose him because we love him or we choose him because we have no other choice. Same way with us. How many of you want to have a mate that you believe is with you because they have no other choice? You want them to be with you because they chose to love you. And you chose to love them. So God didn't set Adam and Eve up in the garden. He gave them the opportunity to have a free will and make a real choice as to whether they wanted to serve God or not. Now they were naive enough not to protect that, but they did have the choice and that's why it was there. Now let me give you the sixth question. All right, wait. Fifth question, isn't it? What kind of God would create man with a free will and put a million trees of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden and everywhere they turn, they run into a tree that God says you can't have. Watch out, Adam, there's another one. He's trying to trap us. Looks like God's trying to set us up for failure. So if God had put a million trees in there, it would have been cruel, right? You can't go anywhere that you don't bump into one of those trees that God doesn't want us to have. Or number six, what kind of God would create man with a free will, give us the ability to use it against him, 
with only one simple choice to rebel, but would also pay the penalty himself for that rebellion in order to redeem us back into a relationship with him so he could give us back everything we lost. That's our God. That is amazing. It took me a long time to write that sentence, I'm telling you. That's one big sentence, by the way. <laughs> Did you divide it in the notes? That's one big sentence. I told Tanya, I said, I'm going to give you a real challenge. Punctuate this. <laughs> so if you have the notes, you see how she punctuated it. Let me read it again because it's really a message just in itself. It's just, this is just it. This is the totality of what God did so that we could get back everything. What kind of God would create man with a free will, give us the ability to use it against him with only one simple choice to rebel, didn't have a bunch of choices. It was real simple. You got one choice. So it, it wasn't complicated. Nobody got confused about anything. One simple choice to rebel. But would also pay the penalty himself for that rebellion in order to redeem us back into a relationship with him so he could give us back everything we lost. Is that not genius? God knows everything, doesn't he? I mean... That is so impressive. That is our God. And he's the one who did that. He's, he's perfect. And when you look at God from any angle, he's perfect. Everything he does in our lives is perfect. Everything he's done in creation is perfect. And folks, Jesus is coming back, I believe, very soon. Now, I don't know the day or the hour. I, 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 it would be foolish to even try to put a time span on anything because I'm a man, I don't know. Jesus said he didn't know. Only God knows. The angels don't know. So I'm certainly not gonna say he's coming back next week or today or whatever. But I'm just saying, in my spirit, I sense that it's very soon. Because all of the things that we see happening now in rapid succession, it's been seven weeks of a new administration. And it's multiple disasters and catastrophes every day. Multiple ones that are going to destroy this nation and this world's going with it. I don't know how it could last, is what I'm saying to you. <laughs> really, I don't know how it could. But God has a plan, and everything, God puts nations up and pulls nations down. God, God controls the leaders of lands and the hearts and all of those things, and God has a plan, and he's told us about it 1,500 years before Jesus was ever born on this earth. And he told us ever since then, and Jesus told us multiple times, and all the prophets have said it. God told us more about these days that we're in right now than anything else. 30% of the Bible is about these days we live in right now. That's how much God wanted us to know so we could be safe and comforted in these days. I'm going to tell you something. If I didn't believe that, I don't know how I'd live right now. I'd be so filled with anxiety and stress and everything else that I don't even know if I could function. But I do believe God, and I believe God has told us and that what he's told us is reliable and that we have a purpose on this earth and that we need to continue doing that until the day that Jesus comes. <laughs> don't, don't quit living now and get out in the woods somewhere and start trying to keep everybody away from your food or something. Just go on with life now. Just go on with life. Be cautious. I mean, take care of yourself and you know, don't be crazy and all of that. But just know that God's got it in control, and, uh, and it, that's a comfort to my soul. And if you don't know the Lord, or if anybody you love doesn't know the Lord, and you want to make an effort to say, man, you, you, these days are short. Come on, you've you got to get right now. This would be the time to start doing that. 
because it's close. I, I really believe that. All right, let's bow our heads.